Well, welcome uh, to our first text to sermon session for the spring semester 2023. Uh, we're glad you have come. We'll continue uh, next Friday. Uh, Father Michael Nabonte from Christ the King Anglican Church will be our speaker. And then the following two Fridays, so we will uh, we'll go until uh, through February the 17th. I hope you'll come. Uh, to each of these sessions. If you haven't been to Text a Sermon, this is uh, offered by the Preaching Institute of Beeson Divinity School. I'm Dr. Mike Pascarello. I direct the Preaching Institute. And our aim here is to uh, just have preachers give us a behind-the-scenes look at how they move from Scripture to a sermon that they have preached. Okay? And uh, our speaker today is... Um, Reverend Andrew Russell, he's uh, a Beeson grad, class of 2019. He serves as a priest at St. Peter's Anglican Church in Mountain Brook. Um, he's not a celebrity preacher. Uh, he, he's not on TV. You're not on TV, are you? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> not yet. Uh, but I invited Andrew as a recent grad because I know uh, from personal experience that he is someone who takes his calling to proclaim the Word of God very seriously and works at it with great care and diligence. And I thought it would be good for us to hear from him today uh, on a sermon that he has uh, just recently preached. So let me pray, and then we'll turn it over to Andrew. Father, we thank you for this food. We thank you that you nourish us in so many ways, and especially with your word, Jesus Christ, who is the bread of life. So sustain us and energize us and strengthen us today and be with Andrew as he speaks, uh, that his words may uh, address us in, uh, in our minds and our hearts, that we might want to more faithfully serve you. Through Christ our Lord, amen. amen. Okay. Thanks for being here. Um, thank you, Dr. Pasquarello, for inviting me here. Um, I'm honored. I was thinking about this beforehand. I think I might have been in your first preaching class when you when you first came here. Yeah. So, Dr. Pasquarello taught me how to preach. So if this is bad today, we know who to blame. Uh, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm honored to be here. I love Beeson. I'm very grateful for the training I received here. Um, and I want to thank all of you as well for coming. Uh, it's not been that long, so I remember how much you have going on uh, d during the week. So thank you for coming to get some free food. And hopefully a byproduct of that will be that our time together today is useful for you. The first thing for me to mention, uh, again, is that it has not been that long since I was sitting where you are right now. So I'm not here as the most experienced preacher. I'm certainly under no illusions about being the best preacher in the room. But what I can do is, is remember pretty clearly what it was like to be here as a student and remember what I wanted my preaching ministry to be and what I thought it was going to look like. Um, and I can share with you how, boy, oh boy, did I need to reorient my expectations. So let's start with that. <laughs> I, I don't think that what I'm about to describe here is unique to me, uh, but I won't presume to, to speak for all of us. When I was a student here, my desire as a preacher, some, sometimes subconsciously, often not, was that I wanted to do really great things in the pulpit. Uh, I wanted to, you know, plumb the depths of the text. Uh, I wanted to ascend to new heights of understanding and appreciation. And I wanted to tie everything together coherently and beautifully. I wanted to do it all. Uh, you know, I wanted every sermon to capture my text in its totality while also going over every major plot point of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And I wanted to do that perfectly so that Every sermon I preach would be the only sermon my people would ever need to hear in order to understand the gospel. <laughs> okay? So there's a couple of problems with that. Uh, one, we can't do that. We can't do that. 
And one thing I had to do the first time I preached a sermon I didn't like very much was consider how much of that desire that I just talked about came from wanting to glorify God in my preaching and how much of that came from wanting to glorify myself. And I discovered pretty much entirely the the latter. (laughs) Two, even if we could do that, even if we could set out this rich, magnificent feast, if we could set a table that had all the nourishment that our people would need for their entire lives in one meal, they wouldn't be able to eat it all, right? And if they tried, they wouldn't be able to keep most of it down. So that's my first thought on the, on the little handout there, is that we will never be able to do everything we want to in a single sermon. That was a hard lesson for me to learn Uh, And and I suspect that over a lifetime of preaching, I won't do anywhere near what I wanted to when I was preparing for ministry. Uh, I could be wrong about that. I would welcome rebuke uh, from our more experienced preachers, but I don't think I'm wrong about that. What I have found is that my preaching is much more effective for our people when I take time to consider who they actually are and where they are right now. So who am I speaking to? Uh, And of course, that's not a revolutionary insight. I'm sure you've heard that a thousand times, but it's important and it's a hard lesson to learn. And it means that you really have to know your people. And when I make that part of the work, when when I think of preaching, not just as an exegetical or a theological exercise, but as an act of pastoral care, one thing that tends to happen is that I think smaller in my preaching. Okay, now, by that, I don't mean dumb down your sermons. Um, I, I mean that now I know that I, get to, I can play the long game in my preaching. I don't have to set out this magnificent banquet each and every Sunday to be faithful. I just have to give them Sunday dinner, uh, a nourishing meal. Dr. Pascarello told me that in 2018, and five years later, I'm starting to learn it. Okay, so listen to this man now. <laughs> Okay, we get to do this every week. Maybe not us individually, but these people get to hear a sermon every single week. Okay, and, and, and I think that faithful and fruitful preaching can build on itself over time. It can go deeper and deeper as our people grow. Okay, so that's, that's what I found uh, for my own preaching. Especially, it's especially true when I consider my specific role at St. Peter's. I think this is maybe one of the differences between myself and some of the other speakers. Uh, I am not a rector or or a senior pastor. I'm an assistant. Specifically, I'm the assistant pastor for families and youth, which is an official way of sounding, uh, official sounding way of saying I'm the youth guy, right? And I I oversee uh, our work with children as well. So, while I have a responsibility to all of our people when I'm in the pulpit, because I'm assisting my rector in his, in his ministry and his shepherding of the entire congregation, I also try to remain keenly aware of my specific sheep when I'm writing a sermon, when I'm studying, when I'm praying, which is a very important part of sermon prep that's easy to neglect. When I'm preaching, I am constantly bringing to mind and bringing before the Lord our parents, our children, our students, because they are just as much members of the body of Christ as our adults, as our well-educated people, as our people who have been believers for a long time, and they need the same gospel. And I think that's really, really important. So that would just be one piece of encouragement that I would offer today. Um, Don't forget about your students. You're preaching to them as well. Don't forget about your children and the people who care for them. Uh, I try to do this with specificity. I use uh, a a practice that Joel Busby taught me. I'm sure most of us know or know of Joel, pastor at Grace Fellowship here in town. Something that he does that I've incorporated into my own sermons is when I have that blank piece of paper sitting in front of me, and I do tend to handwrite the first draft of my sermons, uh, when I have that blank piece of paper sitting in front of me, I write down five names at the top. That's who I'm preaching to. And I'm always one of the names. The other four, I try to get some variations. So, you know, usually a a senior adult, usually a parent, 
uh, you know, single folks, uh, but I always include a student. Um, it's been a very, very helpful practice for me and for my preaching. Thank you, Joel, wherever you are. Um, try it. I, I really, I've benefited a lot from it. It helps me think smaller, play the long game. You're preaching to specific people with specific needs and at different stages of life and, and spiritual maturity. One more thing to mention from my experience post Beeson before we get to the sermon. We are going to get to the sermon. In between graduating from here and joining the staff at St. Pete's, I was a teacher for a bit. I taught Bible and English literature to 6th, 7th, and ninth graders. And I have found that experience to be invaluable uh, for my pulpit ministry. Uh, when I started working at the school, uh, I was required to read this book, The Seven Laws of Teaching by John Milton Gregory. It was written in 1886. Uh, it's a good book. I commend it to you. Uh, I think it'll help you with your preaching. Now, I am aware that preaching, preaching is not synonymous with teaching, but I think we can agree that there's a significant overlap between those two things. Um, and, I, and I have found it very helpful and fruitful to incorporate these seven laws into my sermon prep. Uh, as much as is possible or appropriate, depending on which law we're talking about. Uh, there's two in particular, although I've, you know, I've, I've listed all seven for you because they might be helpful as you actually do some teaching in the church. Uh, but there's two that uh, I've bolded for you, and I find myself coming back to these over and over again for preaching. So if you wouldn't mind, let's just take a look at these laws for a moment on your handout. As a teacher preparing a lesson, here's some guidelines to follow. Number one, a teacher must be one who knows the lesson or truth to be taught. Pretty obvious, but sometimes we're not quite sure <laughs> what we're talking about, right? So we need to thoroughly understand what we're trying to communicate, as much as that's possible when we're talking about the gospel of Jesus. Um, so that would be why, you know, the exegetical work is so important. Two, a learner is one who attends with interest to the lesson given. We're just going to skip that one for now. It's an interesting one. We could apply it in a few different ways, but in the interest of time, let's move on. Number three, the language used as a medium between teacher and learner must be common to both. Use words that are understood by you and by your people in the same sense. Okay, Use language that is clear to both of you. This is very important. Um, the longer I preach, the more I realize that when I use particular phrases or words, even like faith, like repentance, like judgment, I might have a very different idea of what that word means than what the congregation does. Uh, and that one's, that one's going to come up in the sermon for today. Number four, the lesson to be learned must be explicable in the terms of truth already known by the learner. The unknown must be explained by the known. Okay, so we begin with what's already known to our people, and we proceed to the unknown by single, easy, natural steps. And we let the known explain and inform the unknown. Okay, so before I get into that pulpit and start using terms like the beatific vision, or law versus gospel, or even propitiation, Okay? If there's something like that that I think really needs to be included in the sermon, I'm going to start with what my people already know, and we're going to get to those more complex ideas in single, easy, natural steps so that what they know can explain these new things. Okay? Five, teaching is arousing and using the pupil's mind to form in it a desired conception or thought. Invite the people to participate in the sermon. Uh, excite them into discovering the truth of the text along with you. Okay, this is not going to apply to every sermon in the same way, but it lends itself really well to inductive preaching. So if you're an inductive preacher primarily, that's going to be useful for you. My sermon was an inductive sermon. Six, learning is thinking into one's own understanding a new idea or truth. All right, so that's more for the classroom. Uh, but basically, it applies, it, it applies to preaching. We want our listeners to be able to reproduce for themselves what we're trying to get across in their own language. Tell me what I just said, basically, right? Uh, seven, the test and proof of teaching done 
the finishing and fashioning process, must be a reviewing, rethinking, re-knowing, and reproducing of the knowledge taught. Review, review, review. It's important for teaching. It's a lot more important for uh, preaching than I originally thought. Um, you know, we write these things. We spend a lot of time on this material. They only hear it once. You know, maybe twice if you know they're nice enough to go to your podcast feed later and listen to the sermon. They hear it once. So repetition is very important. So take those or leave those as you will. Um, I know that there are like a million uh, methods and philosophies of preaching, and that can get pretty overwhelming. Uh, but I, I find them helpful, so take them or leave them. Three and four, like I said, have become indispensable to me. Uh, that, that common language and moving from known to unknown. Now again, that doesn't mean you have to dumb down your sermon. Okay, I, I have never been told by our people that my preaching is childish or simplistic. Now they might be saying that to everybody but me. <laughs> uh, but they've never said it to me, so I'm going to run with it, <laughs> okay? What it does mean is that our sermons should be clear. Uh, our sermons should be written for the people to whom we are speaking, and they should take into account how it is that people hear, process, and internalize new stuff, right? You don't have to sacrifice depth or beauty for that. And it's taken me a long time to figure that out. So in light of that, let's talk about the sermon. All right, this is a sermon I preached on Christmas Day, just like over a month ago. It's a shorter sermon than I would normally preach. Uh, it was just under 15 minutes. Uh, I usually preach 25 to 27 before our Baptist and Presbyterian brothers and sisters come after me. Uh, I do normally preach longer than this. But, you know, this was a smaller service. Uh, we had just had Christmas Eve the night before. That's sort of our principal Christmastide service. Uh, so this is a shorter one. My text was John 1. 1 through 18. I kind of got to choose it. Um, as you may have guessed, you know, I'm an Anglican, so I come from a lectionary tradition. There are a few options for Christmas, but I'm also an assistant pastor, so my rector got first choice. And uh, from what was left, it, it was John for me. This is the one that jumped out at me. I'm sure that we can agree before we even start talking about this text that it is an insanely rich text, right? Uh, there, there is so much gospel in this text, so many different facets of the gospel that we could explore. I could do a whole sermon on this moniker, the word, that John uses. I could do a whole sermon about the word as creator, uh, the, this motif of life and light. I could talk about John the Baptist for, for 15 minutes, right? I could talk about this, these phrases, belief in his name, the right to become children of God, the new birth, the word becoming flesh, beholding his glory, this seeming contrast between the law coming through Moses and grace and truth coming through Jesus. There's a lot that we can talk about, but I can't do everything, as we've already established. And in 15 minutes, I don't think I even want to do more than one thing. Which, by the way, is something that I'm seeing the value of more and more, even in longer sermons. So I decided to focus on verse 14. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Uh, and really, I zoomed in even closer into that second clause. We have seen His glory. That's really the focus of the sermon. Uh, so let's take a look at the outline briefly on your handout. In my introduction, I begin by drawing a contrast between what we're accustomed to from the culture around us at Christmas time and, and what the real invitation is for the season. Okay, so there's a lot of things vying for our attention at Christmas. There's family, there's gifts, there's cookies, there's lights, the Reba McIntyre CMT Christmas extravaganza. You know, there's like all kinds of stuff vying for our attention. And we can get drawn in by all that stuff because it's screaming out, Look at me, right? look at me, look at the lights, look at the TV, look at the presents. But what this day is about is the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory. So this day then is an invitation to stop looking and to start seeing. Okay, and I'm going to come back to that at the end of the sermon, but basically what I'm getting at here is you know, the difference between 
our attempts to justify ourselves and receiving Jesus as a gift, right? Looking, taking versus seeing, receiving, okay? So come and see. Come and see something far more extraordinary than lights. Come and see the Word of God made flesh, the Son of God become the Son of Man, right? Stop looking around and see His glory. Now already, we're hitting up against that third law of teaching, common language, because I know what I mean when I say glory, uh, and, I, and I think and hope and pray that it's what John means, uh, but odds are pretty good that that's not what the congregation understands glory to mean. So my goal then is to get us to the point where the congregation and I share a common language, uh, we have, where we have a, a common understanding of glory, uh, an understanding that's grounded in and consistent with the glory of God revealed in Jesus Christ as expressed in the Gospel of John. Okay, and so how am I going to do that? I'm going to move from known to unknown, law four. Okay, and that's my first real point, number two on the handout. The world's glory. So when we hear the word glory, you know, I, I'm asking the congregation, what are the kinds of things that come to mind? Back in the day, it's going to be kings, right, who had military prowess and great riches and lots of land. It's powerful warriors. It's people with extraordinary talent. So people who accomplished great things and had a lot of stuff. Okay? These days, it's celebrities and artists and influencers and athletes, right? So nowadays, it's more like who can get the most attention. Okay? But these are the, the people and things that the world deems worthy of glory. We know that. So step one toward the unknown is just this. That's not what the glory of God revealed in Jesus Christ looks like. Okay? How do we know that? One way we know that is because basically nobody in Israel at the time of Jesus recognized him for who he was. He was in the world and the world didn't know him. He came to his own and his own people didn't receive him. Right? So they were so busy looking for a God, for a Messiah, who would conform to their expectations, that they couldn't see his glory because it doesn't look like the world's glory. So if we want to see Jesus' glory, then we need to let go of our conventions and our expectations, and we need to see how God himself describes his glory in the Bible. To do that, I'm going to start with a story they know, and then I'm going to move to a psalm that they probably won't recognize as easily. Okay, but we're going to start with the known, Exodus 34. Most people know this story, um, if only because, you know, our Sunday school teachers got a kick out of telling us that God showed Moses his backside. <laughs> um, but most people know it. So at the end of chapter 33, Moses asked God to show him his glory. And after establishing the parameters of what that's going to look like, uh, the glory of the Lord does pass by Moses. Okay. And as his glory passes by, God says something, and I'm sure you can quote it to me. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, right? We forget that part of the story. But according to God himself, the glory of God is inextricable from the mercy of God and the grace of God and the patience of God and the love of God and the faithfulness of God. That's where we see his glory. Now, having established that, I'm going to take that next step from known to unknown. Psalm 138. It's a psalm of thanksgiving. The psalmist is you know, thanking God in the presence of the congregation because, verse 2, you have exalted above all things your name and your word. And how did God do that? The psalmist immediately explains in the very next sentence, on the day I called, you answered me. That's how God exalted himself. Interesting juxtaposition there between exaltation and condescension. Right? And, and as the psalm continues, the high point where we get the clearest picture of the glory of God, according to this psalmist, is verse 6. Though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. Right? So the God of the Bible has no time for the world's kind of glory. He doesn't chase the same kind of glory that we do. While we are so busy looking for ways to exalt ourselves, God is lowering himself to us, and that's glorious. 
if we stop looking around for things to climb on so that we can get up to God, we, we might be able to see that God is never more exalted than when he lowers himself to us, when he gets off his throne and comes down to his people, when he dwells with us. And so I bring it back to John. Uh, and here's really where I gave my proposition. Jesus' glory was revealed when he got off his throne to dwell with you. So, so he's lifted up when he comes down to dwell with you in your flesh, in your temptations, in your life, in your death. Right? He came to be with you, with us. And that starts today on Christmas, comes to a climax on the cross or as Jesus says in John 12, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified, right? And on the third day, He will pull us out of the grave with Him to dwell with us forever. And now having discovered that together, there's really nothing else to do but come and see His glory. We don't have to go looking for Him. He came to us. So receive Him as a gift, okay? Okay. Uh, and and that's that's where I ended it. Uh, you might wonder where the application was there. Maybe that's something you'll want to talk about. I struggled with that a little bit. Uh, eventually, I decided that is the application. Come and see His glory. Um, I didn't have the sense I needed to get more specific. Uh, if we behold the glory of Jesus like that, that's going to change everything. It's going to change every part of who we are. And I think at a certain point, we have to trust that um, God really is speaking. Uh, through us. And the Holy Spirit is far more capable of doing that specific work in the lives of our people than I am. So that's where I left it. And that's it. That's the talk.